This is Ken Rockwell with KenRockwell.com and KenRockwell.tv. Let's today take a look at the new Sony A6600 APS-C mirrorless digital camera. First, let's take a look at some of the pictures I can make with this camera and this particular 18 to 135 lens, which is a great choice for general use for just about everything. Of course, this camera can take sharp and colorful pictures. That's all a question of the photographer, not the camera. It's not 1943 anymore. Beautiful light, beautiful colors. I shoot these pictures in the vivid mode of this camera with an additional plus three saturation setting. And to be honest, I prefer even bolder colors that I can't get out of this camera, but that's what the Sony cameras do. In lower light, here's a shot, totally handheld, no problem. As the sun's going down, there's no question about this camera's ability to take a great picture. That's more of a function of the photographer than the camera. What's new about this camera compared to the A6500 that it replaces? Well, of course, it's got the same overall specifications for just about everything, including a built-in image stabilizer, but there's one very important thing missing, which is a very important thing to me as a guy who actually shoots every day. There's no more built-in flash. That is a real problem for me. For still photography, I use the built-in flash for fill flash for almost every photograph I take of people or animals in every light other than pitch black. For instance, outdoors in daylight, backlight, indoors light, that's very important. And here's why. Here's a shot taken with this camera and this lens with, of course, no built-in fill flash. And this is just a shot of my dog as we're going out for a walk. We're here in the garage looking out from the garage, so the poor little pup is in backlight. Now, this looks like a good enough photograph, but the poor little puppy is sad because there's no fill flash, and notice her little black eyes are just big, black, dead eyes. There's really no life in there. You need a flash in order to make the face stand out and put catch light in the eyes. Here's a shot with a Nikon Z50 with a flash, and you'll see how the pup is emphasized. The pup is nice and bright. <laughs> she's paying attention, she's happy, and you'll notice she has these little catch lights in each of her eyes, which makes her look alive. That is a very significant flaw in what I think is the A6600 for still photographs, unless you want to carry a separate external flash every place you go, but then that to me eliminates a lot of the purpose of this camera. What I like is that anytime I need a little bit of extra push, I just pop up the flash on the other cameras, and every other Sony APS-C camera has that built-in flash. If you're going to say, oh, well, this is a pro camera, but hey, it's an APS-C camera. This isn't a pro camera, and I sure wish it had a built-in flash. In fact, I wish my A7R Mark IV had a built-in flash. That really helps real picture quality. Now, you can't say that the higher ISOs make up for a flash. They don't, because it's the quality of light and the direction of light not just the quantity of light. So that's a real problem for me. So if you're shooting still photos, photographing people and animals in natural light, I would pass on this camera. I believe the purpose of this camera largely is for video, where there's lots of little nifty extra features. Let's cover what else is new compared to the A6500. Besides the missing flash, one of the great things is they now include this super-sized battery. This has over twice as much capacity as last year's battery that all of the other APS-C cameras take. Notice this battery goes in backwards. It doesn't go in the way that you would think that the grip would want it like this. It goes in backwards. Now, the bad thing about this camera is there's no spring loading on this little latch. You actually manually have to slide that home. It's like having a doorknob that doesn't close when you close the door and you have to slide the latch across. The new battery is rated for 720 shots versus only 310 shots of the old battery in the old camera. But more importantly, in actual shooting, I get about 1,500 shots per charge with an even mix of a lot of the just taking a picture, looking at the screen, taking a picture, looking at the screen, as well as rapid sequences where you listen to the camera motor along at 11 frames per second. If what you do is let the camera motor along at 11 frames per second, you'll get thousands of shots per charge. However, if you spend all day looking in menus, zooming in on your picture, wondering how it came out, then you might only get the 720 or fewer pictures. But in any case, this larger battery is great. Although, to be honest, I'd rather have one of the older models that has a built-in flash, and I'll just buy a spare battery, keep it in my pocket, and still pay less and get better pictures. But uh, I didn't say that. 
This also adds a square one-to-one -one crop in its options. That's actually important. I love the square crop, and without the square crop, well, I'll have to crop later. The square crop is awesome because if you're going to shoot in the square, by shooting at the square crop, every place you put the picture, Facebook, wherever, it's going to fill the frame more. Most of your sorting software, I use Camera Bits Photo Mechanic, thumbnails grow because instead of the little 1.5 to 1 image fitting inside the 4x3 thumbnail that most programs offer, most programs use 4 to 3 or a square space to put your images. It fills the frame, it fills the thumbnail, and it gives you much bigger thumbnails and looks awesome. So that's something I really like is the ability to shoot in square. New, new video shooters are going to love this. It's now got a headphone jack, and that alone <laughs> is one of the reasons that people would buy this over last year's camera. The LCD now flips 180 degrees. For those of you who like to giggle and take self-portraits, it flips up like this. And what's a little crazy is you'll notice that the bottom of the screen is a little bit cut off, but you can still certainly see if you're in focus or not if you want to focus and photograph yourself via video or still photographs. The ISO range now goes all the way up to 102,000. The old camera only went up to about 51,000. It's got real-time eye autofocus even in video. It also can do eye autofocus with animals in addition to just humans. The problem is you have to go into the Camera One menu. I have a user's guide online which has all this stuff documented so you can find it easier. Face, IAF Select, and then for subject detection, you have the choice of human or animal. Unfortunately, it's not smart enough yet to figure out the difference automatically. New is it also offers HDR video in 4K versus just regular 4K. But it is S-Log2, S-Log3, HLG, and HLG 1-3 video. What does that mean? It means almost nothing. If you're interested by video quality, far more important than any of this gobbledygook is that the lighting is the most important thing to any video imaging. Why, when we photograph a movie, do you see six trucks of lighting and generators and grips and scaffolding and, and scrims and flags and all that stuff around a movie set? That's to make it look like it was shot with no light at all to make it look totally natural. It takes that much lighting to get your video shot to look like it came from Hollywood. And guess what? S-Log3 isn't going to give you that if you don't have great lighting. If you're worried about how your videos look, worry about your lighting. Contrast detection for autofocus is now up to 425 zones, up from 169 zones. Does it matter? Not in the least. Another wonderful thing about this new camera is, is the card slot. Instead of being right here at the crack, which was nearly impossible to reach, and I would want to shooting across the room, it's now in the back, parallel to the back of the camera. So this is much easier to get the card in and out. But you still have to remember to slide this little latch home for it to stay locked. This new deeper eye cup, now the one, the 6500 that I bought from Adorama arrived like this. With no eye cup, that was convenient. I find this eye cup, which probably came with the old one, but I find this eye cup is uncomfortable. This is much harder rubber than it should be. It pokes my eyes and it hurts, kind of like the PME finder from my Hasselblad, which has this giant stiff eye cup. But on the other hand, I can take this off, and it still works just fine. The panorama mode is no longer on this dial, and I don't know that it has one. I never used it. The panorama mode was cool on these Sony cameras until it came to the iPhone which works so much better. In any case, instead of having the panorama mode, you now have S and Q, which stands for slow and quick, which is Japanese for overcrank or undercrank, where the video modes run at a higher or slower frame rate than the rate at which you present that video, and thus you get slow motion and fast motion, or slow motion and not time lapse, but simply speed up motion or slow down motion. This is now two ounces or 50 grams heavier than the old camera, most of which is due to the bigger battery, and I always love the bigger battery. The beauty is, for the first time in APS-C, I can shoot for a day or more, not even think about bothering to check the battery percentage. In the old cameras, you were always on the hairy edge of running down the camera's battery, so I was always paying attention to that. But this camera, no more. Bad thing is, this is $400 more than last year's A6500, at least as I do this video, at Christmas 2019. Honestly, I miss that built-in flash, and you hear that a lot because it's important. New is... I don't believe that my old 6500 had the My Menu menu. This menu, the My Menu setting, you can add whatever you want. The problem is, historically, I have not gone through everything with this camera, but oftentimes there is a problem wherein you can't get every possible menu item that you want stuck into the My Menu menu. Another beautiful thing of this camera is I measure seven real frames per second in its silent mode. The old camera only ran at a couple of frames per second in silent mode. It certainly goes to 11 frames per second in its high speed mode with the regular shutter.
It runs that. It tracks focus and tracks exposure at those rates, which is marvelous. However, if anything actually changes, i.e., if anything actually moves, which is the whole point of photographing at those high frame rates, then the camera will slow down to try to make sure that every frame is in focus, as it should. But you're not actually going to get 11 frames per second with the real person running towards you. It's going to slow down. And that's just the way these are. To be honest, Sony is the world leader in autofocus performance for mirrorless cameras. If you want to shoot sports and you want to shoot mirrorless, you can buy the Sony A9 or A92. But this is about as good as you're going to get. Honestly, all of the A6000 series have had fantastic autofocus performance. New to this camera is that the silent mode setting is also saved and recalled with these. That sounds silly. But honestly, my position one I use for pictures of places and things, I use the regular shutter. And for photographs of people, I set the silent shutter in number two, where I set different resolutions and so forth. It now remembers the setting of silent shutter or no silent shutter on the older model. I had to set those manually. What's weird is that the histograms now lack vertical divisions. If we take this crazy thing here, you'll notice this. There's no vertical division, so you don't just have this histogram. If you want to know exactly where three quarters or four fifths were as the older cameras, it doesn't have that anymore. The camera's now offshore to China, as opposed to being offshore to Thailand as the 6500 was. <laughs> Otherwise, it's mostly the same as the A6500 was. It's the same 24 megapixel sensor, the same 11 frame per second frame rate with the regular shutter, the same autofocus system hardware, the same viewfinder, the same frame rates for video, and the same video performance as the A6500, minus some of the spiffy new features in video, and some of the autofocus electronics which may allow this camera to do some more spiffier things as I covered in the beginning, things like eye recognition, that's covered in the processing equipment, which I guess you could call hardware. But to be honest, even the original A6000, which you can buy now as of this writing for about $400 brand new, still had what I thought was incredibly good autofocus. So I find it strange that Sony, of all the things they need to improve, like their awful ergonomics, they don't do anything to that, and they keep improving autofocus, or so they claim. But to be honest, even the most basic A6000 had mind-blowingly good autofocus. So, you know, everybody wants something different, but they certainly have great autofocus. This camera is rated for five stops of in-camera sensor shift stabilization. It's got the world's best autofocus system in a mirrorless camera. There's no argument about that. The Nikons, the Canons, uh, they're good for what I shoot, but for action, I'm not going to use those for action from the other brands. It's nice that I can select the autofocus area on my rear LCD. Let's see, can it work now? Well, in any case, when I'm looking through my viewfinder, I can do this, and it moves the selected autofocus area around in the viewfinder while I'm doing this, which I find much more precise and faster and accurate than trying to twiddle with this four-way rear controller. Another nice thing about this camera is, honestly, I only select ISO in full stops, but if you like to set weird stops like, you know, ISO... Th ISO 4000 or, or 8000 or the, you know, third stops, you can select the ISO in third stops from ISO 50 all the way to 102,400. So if you want to set ISO 80,000 or ISO 64, you can do that. Most other brands of cameras, especially at the high end, lock you into high one, high two, high three with nothing in between. And that's sad because those are where the biggest differences between ISOs are found. And you might actually want to set something in between, say, high one and high two. Because on every camera, high two usually looks awful. High one looks usable. And you get nothing in between. That's a good thing about this camera. You should have remote control via a phone app, which I've never used. You have Wi-Fi and NFC. And indeed, the camera is completely silent in its own silent mode. That was new back when these cameras came out, but to be honest today, I think we're all used to totally silent. What's bad? No built-in flash. Crummy handling, and I'll cover that. Certainly it handles more slowly than a DSLR does. All the menus and everything else you twiddle around with, I can get a DSLR set up faster and shoot faster than I can with this. In silent mode, none of these mirrorless cameras, or any camera that shoots in silent mode, can work with flash, the LCD, like all cameras, it's too dim for daylight. It's not an iPhone. It doesn't have automatic brightness control in the LCD, which seems to be relatively unique to Canon cameras. There's a mode you can use to brighten the LCD in daylight, but it's a pain to find. Also, this is a chopped LCD. This is not a full-size, full-frame LCD. You see how the picture only fills a little bit, and this is all rubbish on the side? The actual, this is a 16 by 9 LCD optimized for video. For stills photos, you've only got the equivalent of about a 2.6 inch screen when you actually realize you're losing these sides. That's too bad. What's missing? Again, I will cheerfully say, no built-in flash. 
The touch LCD is great for selecting autofocus areas, but it does not work in the menu system and it does not work in playback. And it especially doesn't work for entering in my copyright information where I have to type like this on other brands of cameras, which is okay, like an iPhone, that doesn't work on this camera. The touchscreen is really a very crippled touchscreen. To set my copyright information for my images, where it says copyrightkenrockwell.com, I still have to do this like it's 1978 with Space Invaders. There's no GPS. There's no front control dial, but here's a secret. You have this main rear control dial. This is also a dial. So you still have two dials for control. There's no exposure compensation dial up here, but you can program any of these. I program the C1 and then I can rotate this and change my exposure compensation. So that's not that bad. This has no way to back up the complete state of the camera. So if you send your camera in for service or get a second one or want to copy my settings off the internet, you can't simply load them to a card. This camera does not support that. There's no second card slot, not a pro camera. It's only one card slot. Now, some people say, oh, I've never had an error. Well, then you haven't shot long enough. And to be honest, here's another reason. Human stupidity is a reason I prefer having two card slots because when I get a little trigger happy with my delete key here, it doesn't delete off the second card in the cameras that I use with backup set. So therefore, I can always recover a deleted image off my backup card to correct for my own stupidity. Also missing is, is some of the more older video rates. I don't have not heard anybody complain about that. If you want to shoot traditional 525 NTSC or PAL or MP4 style video or 720p, doesn't do that. It's all uh, more modern standards. To get into some of the specifics of performance, this is a great little camera except for the built-in missing flash. But to be honest, it's not 2018 anymore. Now that the Nikon Z50 is out, I prefer the Nikon Z50 for my style of shooting. The Nikon Z50's autofocus is nowhere near as fast as this for sports and action. However, for everything else, I prefer the color rendition of the Nikon Z50. I prefer the Z50's built-in flash. I prefer its handling or where the knobs are. We're all different, but honestly, I've been shooting for over 50 years. Nobody sponsors me or pays me to do these things. This is just my personal preference and experience has taught me. I prefer the Z50 because I can get my picture faster with less fiddling, and it looks better because of the built-in flash and the Nikon superior color rendition for when you want crazy, screaming loud, unnatural colors as I favor. Ergonomics. Well, the only good things are is everything is available from one side. For one-handed shooting, my thumb can do everything and handle it all. I don't have to reach over here like on the Nikon Z6 and Z7 full-frame cameras that I don't like. The menu structure is awful. Ask anybody else who uses Sony, there's no question about that. It's mislabeled, disorganized, which means that anytime you want to set something in a menu, you are fiddling around looking all over the entire structure trying to find what you're looking for, and you know what I'm talking about. Yes, the My Menu menu may help, but overall, it's poorly designed and it needs an update, especially now that Canon and Nikon are in the area. Sony's not going to last for long. By long, meaning, you know, five or ten years out, if they don't get themselves updated in that, it's going to be a problem. Once you do get everything set, it's pretty good. The problem is the industrial design of the shape is poor. They didn't think it out. It's uncomfortable. You'll notice very few things are put at any kind of an angle. And if they are, it's, they look at this. They didn't even make it a steep enough angle. It's like the designer didn't want to get in trouble for putting a real angle on it. So you can put the proper angle for shutter button. With this, you have to reach back and push it at this crazy thing. To reach this button is very uncomfortable. You can't see that it's uncomfortable. But number one, it's not up here where I can reach it. I have to pull back. And then these buttons are all flush. Yes, there's a little bit of a rise here. But for the most part, these buttons are flush. These buttons are flush. See if I can show that. Which means you can't feel these while you're shooting. Which means you can't just shoot. You have to stop and fiddle around and look for them. And heaven help you if you're wearing gloves. Forget about it. Auto ISO works great. You have complete flexibility to set the highest and lowest ISO starting from ISO 100 up to ISO 100 and 2000. You have complete flexibility in setting the lowest shutter speed below which the camera starts increasing the ISO. So there's no complaints there. It's got state-of-the-art auto ISO selection. High ISOs look great. Sony is the world leader in making CCDs for cameras and CMOS image sensors for cameras. They've been doing that. I used to work for their <laughs> U.S. representative back in 1993 when Sony already was the world leader in these things. So there's no question that its high ISO performance is superb. I'm showing here now, going up through all the various ISOs. This is the complete image. This is the full image. And you'll see as we go up an ISO... There is little to no change in the images. The only thing changing is the fact that the clock is moving. But the overall highlights and shadows look the same, which is excellent performance. Digital cameras didn't used to do that. Digital cameras used to change their highlights or shadows or color rendition, and it used to look bad as ISOs went to crazy town. 
But this, the only real change is a little bit of modeling, a little bit of green magenta blobs as noise, chroma noise, as the ISOs go a little bit crazier, and a little more grain at the highest ISOs, and only at this very highest ISO of 102,000 does it start to look pretty ratty. The real difference, and this is the case with all cameras, is when we zoom in. This is a 600 by 450 pixel crop from the 6,000 by 4,000 pixel original images. And if you look at the fine details, especially if you look at the filigree between the digits on the clock, you'll see how those go away as the ISO increases. And also the detail in the fur of the little Christmas friends. As you go up an ISO, the hard lines stay about the same because the noise reduction software is looking for those. The fine details go away because the noise reduction is scrubbing them out and <laughs> using its digital electronic eraser to scrub those out along with the noise in those areas. Noise reduction is a very dynamic process. Remember, the camera has no way to tell what's noise and what's not noise. What it's doing is looking for correlation in things that are real, like a line, horizontal, vertical, diagonal. A line, it says, okay, this is a real part of the signal. Leave that in. And other areas, it says, well, let's smudge this out. If you have an area with fine detail, it can't really tell the difference between fine detail like wood grain or concrete and noise. And so it all goes away. Mechanically, there's no news here. The camera's half plastic and half metal. The top and bottom covers are metal. The LCD frame is all plastic. These buttons, actually, they vary. One of these is metal and one of these is plastic. These are all plastic. The door's plastic. There's no news there. Data, again, it's standard for Sony. It doesn't properly title formatted cards. It leaves them titled as untitled, which matters to me because when I plug these cards into, into my computer after coming back from a shoot, I want the cards to be marked what cameras they were so I know what is plugged into my computer. To have multiple things marked untitled makes it very difficult for me to figure out what camera and what card is what in the finder of my Macintosh. What is nice is I can rename the prefaces of each file name. So instead of having DSC, and I don't know why they still use DSC to preface the various file names, I use A66, or I could use KEN. The beauty of it is this way, when I load the files into my machine, forever now, I know the camera on which they were shot simply in the finder without having to look to EXIF data. Let's compare it to some other cameras. To compare it to the A6500 of 2016, which it replaces, well, I've covered that through this entire video. To compare it to the other cameras in the Sony A6000 series, you can follow the link to my website where I have a written description comparison of all the Sony cameras. The main thing to know is that all the Sony APS-C mirrorless cameras use the same 24 megapixel sensors. The oldest ones aren't quite as good at the ridiculously high ISOs. In other words, the original A6000 looks a little ratty at ISO 25,000. Looks about the same as this camera looks at ISO 100,000, but you shouldn't be shooting at those ISOs except in very special circumstances. I find one of the biggest problems is that consumers will come to me saying, Ken, why isn't my picture sharp? It's because they did something dumb, like setting it to ISO 25,000, then shooting it like F22 at a four thousandth of a second in broad daylight, which is not the way to go. That's not the camera's fault. Other than that, the other cameras all have a built-in flash and have pretty much the same autofocus which is extremely good performance and image quality performance. So I don't see the reason behind buying this A6600. Yes, the autofocus system may be improved on paper. The key is the old ones had just as good autofocus for all practical purposes. To compare to the Nikon Z50, I prefer the Z50. Why? Well, number one, it's got a built-in flash. Number two, it is far superior ergonomics. These buttons are where I need them to be. You notice the buttons are angled. They all feel different. They stick out enough that I can feel them with my fingers. See, they all have different feelings, so I can get to these more easily. The menu system is far superior. The image quality is superior if you shoot out of the camera as JPEGs as I do. I need to get saleable images that I can download out of the camera and get them straight off to the client. I don't have the time to fiddle with each image. Now, if you're a consumer and are working in an office where you can play for, you know, spend actually three minutes editing a picture, that'd be great. But I don't have that benefit because I need to get on to the next job. The Nikon Z50 is not a good choice for sports or action. A DSLR is. And if that's what you're shooting, then by all means, get one of the Sonys for sports and action. To compare to a DSLR, a DSLR is faster. It's going to have better autofocus. It's not going to have a faster frame rate unless you get into something like a Canon 1DX Mark II. But the autofocus and overall handling of a DSLR will be faster. And primarily, if you're shooting sports and action, go with a DSLR. Versus Fujifilm, 
oh my gosh, Fujifilm is like night and day different from this camera because Fujifilm has real aperture rings, real shutter speed rings, real exposure compensation and ISO rings. Mechanically, the Fujis are far superior as opposed to the Sonys, which are pretty darn bad. The menu system of Fuji is just as screwed up as Sony. The autofocus of the Sony cameras is far superior to Fuji. But the real question that the consumers who ask me this just sadly just don't have the experience to understand this. The pictures look totally different between Fuji and every other brand. The Fuji cameras are highly optimized for people pictures. They have relatively low contrast, low color saturation. It's almost as if the Fuji cameras are in permanent portrait mode. If you're photographing people in flesh tones, the Fujis are the world's best. For everything else, I prefer the Sonys. For pictures of places and things, I certainly prefer the color rendition that I can get out of my Nikons and my Canons when I set them to their highest saturation settings to give me the look that I want for my images. And of course, everybody has a different preference, which is why these cameras have these adjustments. However, I find the range of adjustments of my Nikons and Canons are broader and let me get the look that I demand that I can't get from this Fuji. For people pictures, again, I would just grab my Fuji. Final recommendations. The loss of the built-in flash to me is a serious loss. And so I don't know why I would want to spend the money that they're asking for this camera today when I could get the older model, which includes that flash. And the other features that they've added look great on paper. But again, with my experience, I don't even know or care what those features are. That lack of a flash makes my pictures look less good from many of the things that I shoot. And so that's the scoop. If you shoot video, maybe it has some features. But to be honest, I don't get this camera. Keep a lookout for the A6100. I'm still waiting for my A6100 to show up. That camera, which sells for almost half the price of this camera, appears to add the built-in flash and have every other feature just the same. I'm not sure what the differences are. To be honest, I think for most people who really know what they're doing, the 6100 is it. I have a sneaking suspicion the A6600 people who just say, well, it's got more features, it costs more, it must be better and going to get me better pictures. Uh, the world doesn't work that way. In any case, thanks again for watching Ken Rockwell, kenrockwell.com and kenrockwell.tv.